many of you, when you saw my name, thought that uh, there'd be a musical performance here at the conference. <laughs> but I will spare you the, the pain of listening to me sing and try to play the guitar. Instead, I'll share with you uh, some thoughts that I have in relation to uh, the importance of dialogue. Now, what I, uh, what I do professionally is I'm the director of a center called the Center for Interfaith and Cultural Dialogue. And the objective of the center broadly is to build respect between different communities by helping develop understanding between these communities. So for, for me, my background is conflict resolution. And dialogue is actually a, uh, a tool or an instrument of uh, bringing people together. The result of which is hopefully stronger communities. So what I wanted to do with my uh, presentation today was actually talk about a very um, applied approach to, to dialogue. And I originally had planned on using uh, some examples around uh, violent radicalization in Australia. But I think given the context that that's, has been set this morning, I'll uh, pass over that for now. We can talk about it in questions or at another time. And get to a, a framework for evaluating dialogues. Because it is nice for us to come together and chat, <coughs> to learn about each other. But if we are wanting to build our communities, strengthen our societies, well, we want to take uh, a bit more of an intentional approach. We want to, to know how to, to do this. So I'm putting forward a framework that will uh, help potentially guide us. Not saying it's the best one that's out there. Uh, but it's one that we can at least look at and start tearing apart to help us build others as well. Now, <clears throat> this framework, it's, it's based on nine um, principles that are taken from uh, Habermas's, Jürgen Habermas's work on deliberative democracy. Uh, and modified them quite a bit. And I break them down into three areas. So looking at this process of dialogue, right? These three areas are... Um, Principles around participant communication, so, so ways to guide our communication with one another. Participant composition, so ways to guide who is participating in the dialogue. And then finally, um, characteristics on the process themselves, itself. So what, how should our, this dialogue process look like, or ways that we can uh, evaluate that. Now the first three of these, the first four that you see up, uh, up on the slide here, are in the participant communication. Because frankly, when we're talking about dialogue, we are talking about communicating with one another. It's not just simply a scripted approach that we go through the steps of and have the result that we wanted when we showed up in the room. That's, that's not what it is. It is about back and forth communication. So. Some of the ways to, to guide this are, first of all, what I say, what I call uh, reason. Now, the question that you would ask in evaluating a process or design, beginning to design one, is: Was reasoned argument a characteristic of the communication between those involved in the process? Now, any of you familiar with um, Habermas's work? When he talks about re reason, it's, it's quite often uh, synonymous with rationality kind of a Western uh, rationality, but I modify that quite a bit to say um, reasoned argument means that reason is given for it. And when we're talking about interfaith dialogue, for example, uh, that can be spiritual reasons or doctrinal reasons. If we're talking about intercultural dialogue, that can even be uh, some of the foundation myths that are uh, a big part of our, um, our culture. But that it is thought about and it is explicit the reasons behind um, the arguments or the points that, that we're making. Um, but it's not just reason alone that's going to help us learn from each other. And especially it's going to make me open to you, uh, to, to learning from you. So the next principle is a public good. That when we are trying to talk about why this is how the world should be, if we're talking in normative terms, or if we have an objective that we feel needs to be achieved, that our argument for that, our justification for that, be in terms of a public good. 
that we say the reason for this is not just to benefit me or my own community, but that it is of actual benefit to the broader to the broader world. This isn't a selfish uh, dialogue or process that I'm engaged in. That this is bigger than this. And when you do that, that can be contested as well in a dialogue. That can be wait, 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 one second. You think that you know um, everybody should wear blue jeans, but you know, in fact, I don't. I don't think that is. You think the world would be better if we all wore blue jeans, but I think we should be allowed to wear slacks and or lava lavas or you know wherever we are in the world. A third principle to to guide um, participant communication is uh, what I call respect. Now you you will have heard. Uh, respect being mentioned uh, a few times today. What is the word for respect in uh, Romanian? How would that be translated? Respect. Respect. Uh, I didn't realize I spoke Romanian. <laughs> but my children must not because they don't seem to understand when I'm trying to t teach them about respect. So I'll have to, have to teach them Romanian as well. <clears throat> but when we talk about respect, when you have parties that come together, there's a wide range of motivations or ways to describe respect. I can respect you because, well, if I, if I don't include you in the process, the, we probably won't have a good chance of reaching a, a resolution or a conclusion that's sustainable or durable. Or there can be respect out of, well, you are in a position of power and there's something either I want to avoid um, you um, disciplining me or you have access to something that I want. So there's that type of respect as well. But the respect I'm talking about in terms of this is respect that you come with differences, you come with uniqueness, is perhaps a better way, that I don't have. Be that because of your religious background, be that because of your cultural background, your own personal experiences. And it's those things that I want to draw upon for us to build our communities, for us to, to have a, a sustainable um, outcome to this dialogue. So it's respecting that uniqueness of the other. So in a process that's built on this, you would ask, what was respect for difference between the participants, a part of the process, or did it develop during the process? A good process hopefully will strengthen respect. And then finally, the, the fourth one is this idea of reflexivity. This is very much a, a deliberative democracy um, concept. Uh, but reflexivity, it's, it kind of means two things. One is, were the participants in the dialogue, were they conscious of the broader institutional and social environment in which this process took place? So remember earlier we talked about public good. Well, this is one way to sharpen that, and it's being aware of the context in which we are, we are discussing. So I, my, my own faith background is a, a Latter-day Saint or Mormon, that's what uh, many of you would call. And, and being aware that my engagement with, say, um, uh, Romanian Orthodox or something like that could impact the, those future relations, for example. Or maybe it will only impact our personal relationship, be that work or something, but being aware of this broader context in which our dialogue is taking place. But it's not just simply reflexive enough to, to be aware of that, but also is the dialogue such that um, those who participate are free to question and even reshape this broader environment. So it's engaging with it and making it a part of the dialogue process. All right, so that's the, those are the first four on uh, participant communication. Let's, uh, let's move to the next, the next couple. This is on participant composition, as in who should be part of this process. Now, the first one's probably the easiest. This is what comes to mind quite, quite a bit, this idea of pluralism. So did the process allow for the space and opportunity for participants um, who might be impacted by the issue and dialogue? And so what, what I mean by a space and opportunity, it's not just simply do we have all the right people at the table dialoguing, but is it, is it an environment in which they can uh, participate in the dialogue? I'll give some, uh, an example. Um, we do interfaith dialogues, and one of the great things about my center is that uh, it's kind of a neutral ground because we're on a public university 
campus, I, I have a building with space that we use for dialogues. And we had a, an incident in the uh, Muslim community where the, the police, the Queensland police, were going to uh, raid a number of uh, businesses and homes and planning on making a number of arrests. But they wanted to do a bit of meeting with uh, community leaders first to say, look, this is happening today. We want to be in communication with you so things don't blow up and go crazy. But where are you going to have a meeting like that? Are you going to do it in a mosque? Well, a lot of the police wouldn't have felt very comfortable you know, going into um, the heart of a community that they're about to, to raise. They felt that you know, it's a bit hip hypocritical and even dangerous for us. But would you invite them to come to the police station as well? Well, of course not. That's, <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't get very many people showing up. So finding the right space for this to, to take place is very important with a number of these dialogues. But also the opportunity. Um, for example, um, we have different ways and different traditions of communicating and presenting reasons. Sometimes it's through storytelling. Uh, a, a very important group in Australia is, of course, the Aboriginal uh, uh, populations there. And an important part of them communicating is actually through stories. It's, it's quite literally storytelling that they, that they give rather than giving a PowerPoint presentation or a lecture or something like that. So it's the opportunity there for them to be able to express in, uh, in terms that are comfortable for them. <clears throat> and then finally, in terms of uh, participant comp composition, there's this idea of ecology. And I put this in here because we're facing a number of challenges in the world, and they're not just socioeconomic. We have uh, large issues with, with our environment that then impact our socioeconomic um, uh, challenges. So I want to ask is, was the process open to attempts by all participants to also incorporate the voice of the environment? How do you bring the environment into a dialogue and you think, why would you do that in an interfaith dialogue or an intercultural dialogue? Well, because quite frankly, the environment is a very important part of our faith traditions. I don't know a faith tradition that doesn't have teachings on our relationship, responsibility for, stewardship, brotherhood with, however you term that, uh, the environment. But also, uh, the, the same goes with culture. But also, it's often um, uh, passed over, and I think there are a number of these issues that if we do engage intercultural dialogue or interfaith dialogue to address them, such as climate change, we can bring perspectives and strengths and opportunities together that um, we wouldn't normally have. A quick example is we've just held uh, earlier in May, uh, what, which I guess is now last month because today's June 1st. Happy June 1st, everybody, by the way. <laughs> we had um, the Pacific Interfaith Summit, which is where we had a number of groups from around the Pacific Ocean come together to discuss uh, important issues. One of them was response to climate change. As you may recognize, a number of Pacific Island nations are threatened quite seriously by the uh, climate changes. <clears throat> and then moving on to the next slide, Dr. Dura. Thank you. We have the process characteristics themselves. So what does this process of dialogue look like? Well, first, uh, it would be a dynamic process. That doesn't mean you have really interesting dynamic people there. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen every time. But what you will get is, uh, if you work at it, is a process that adapts to match the changing socio-political and environmental conditions and relationships. Because uh, quite often, dialogue is not, it's not a one-off event. If you have a challenge or the desire is to build community, you don't just bring a, a bunch of the, you know, the, the old guys together and we sit around a table and have a good chat and everything's worked out. This is, a dialogue is a process that, that goes on and things change. People move on to different positions or pass away or, or issues such as new elections or relationships or challenges arise and the process needs to be flexible to, or dynamic enough to match that. But also, not just being dy dynamic, but that the process has a characteristic of unboundedness. This is an awkward word, and I feel sorry for the translator trying to figure out what, how in the world am I going to say that in Romanian. Unless, of course, it's unboundedness, like respect was respect. But um, by unboundedness, what I mean is, does the process address 
the problem shed or the issue shed? Um, does the process match the breadth and depth and width of the issue that's, gonna, that's in dialogue? Rather than stopping at jurisdictional limits, be they, um, we're, we're in an archdiocese, be they at the, the, the archdiocese level, or we're in Romania, so they just stop at the Romanian borders, or any of these, that it tries to bring in those that contribute to a solution, whatever the jurisdictional limits may be. And then finally, this is probably the most quintessential deliberative democratic principle uh, of this framework, is it's a, is it's a reflective uh, process. So, a process that gives participants the space and opportunity to reflect on the arguments or uh, reasons that others present. And sometimes that's, hey, let's have a break. We'll go and discuss this in smaller groups or we'll let you return to your group that you're a representative of to discuss the things that, uh, that we've, been di we've been dialoguing around and bringing that information back. <clears throat> Were uh, the participants given the means to understand and reflect on these arguments? So we talked about giving people an opportunity to, to dialogue in a way that's comfortable for them and a space that's comfortable for them, but also is there the space and opportunity for people to understand that, to reflect on that, to, to make sure that they really got what was happening? Sometimes that's sim simple enough to have a translator in the room, but other times that means uh, uh, other spaces and, and processes. Another question to ask in this one was, were perspectives changed as a result of the reflective process? Did people learn? And not just simply learn as a way, oh, now I know what I'm going to say next time I get you know, asked this question or I'm in this situation. But did my perceptions change? Did I begin to understand? And it's this beginning of understanding that you can begin to respect, uh, increase in respect. And then finally, and this is very important, we talked about dynamism in the process, this is, this is one aspect of it, but still it's, it's part of a reflective process, is was the dialogue process revisited to measure the, the impacts, its outcomes, and to maintain the relationships built between the, the participants? And what I, what I present with, with a framework like this is just a, a way of us to, to be a bit more intentional about the dialogues that we engage in. If we as uh, educational institutions or churches uh, or governments, partners, are, are serious about dialogue, it's just not enough to open a door and, and throw some people in there and shut it until they come out and said, hey, we respect and understand each other. Thank you so very much. But we can plan it for this. We can uh, anticipate challenges and work to, uh, to mitigate those. And so, thank you very much for, for letting me come, for being part of this. But the, being in Romania, it's my very first time. I'm very excited about that. And I look forward to any questions that you have in, in relation to this. Thank you.